Uh, good morning, ladies and gents. Um, I'm Cindy Norcott. I'm the CEO of Pro Talent. Um, we've just this week ex um, enjoying our 30th anniversary of being in business. And we thought we'd just uh, connect with some of you via um, a webinar um, just to share some thoughts on where the market is at the moment and give you a few tips and insights because the market has changed a lot in the last few years and you know it just reminds me I had a client complain about about a year ago to say you know your your one recruiter is so rude I can't believe it she she has told me that the candidate will see me at this time how dare she and if that's what the candidate's like I'm not interested <laughs> and I said no she's not being rude and the candidate's not being difficult everything has changed and mm -hmm. and I remember the client just sounding so um aghast and going I can't believe it tell me what's changed because I think what's been happening for the last four years since COVID many of us have been literally in survival mode dealing with all the pivoting we've had to do all the changes mm -hmm. and in that time what's happened is a lot of people um, uh, there, there's been a big shift in in the power that um, candidates have and we're not talking low level candidates we're actually talking top talent at the moment so um, I saw um, I saw a statistic. I love statistics. I often make them up, but this one I didn't make up. Um, Seventy-seven percent of employers struggled to fill open positions in the past year. I don't know if any of you feel like that. That's quite a big, um, onerous statistic. But what we are noticing at Pro Talent is we, if we look ten years ago, five years ago, our biggest challenge as an agency was to get a job spec from a client. And um, we had so many candidates. Now we are getting in job specs from ca uh, clients every day, often on the hour. Um, and the biggest challenge is to find the right person. And I think some of you can probably identify with the challenge that we are facing. So yeah, I think what's happened over the last um, four years is the the whole hybrid and remote work has has opened up all geographical boundaries. Whereas we used to be very much a localized, wasteful based agency focusing on the greater Durban area. We've been able to open up to a whole national um, uh, clientele and candidates as well as some international clients as well. And because it's been so easy for us to do that, it's been very easy for international companies to attract our wonderful top talent. And South Africa is a third world country. And um, there are statistics that show that every th third world country right now is experiencing a massive brain drain. Um, the reason is the first world countries can pay better. They also um, often have better living conditions. Um, and a lot of people are mobile, they're upwardly mobile. So if somebody has a scarce skill, they, they are looking for those opportunities, which, which doesn't bode well for the local employers who are saying, you know what, we just need a great bookkeeper, we need a great sales rep, or we need a good IT person. Why is it so hard to find that person? So today, I wanted to start off um, just by introducing Rose Govender. Um, I'm the owner and the CEO of Pro Talent, but Rose is actually our general manager. Rose has been with me for four years. She has a, a degree in, in um, HR management and marketing management, and she has 15 years experience in HR and recruitment. And she does this nine hours a day, if not 10 or 12 some days. And um, <laughs> So uh, Rose, I want to hand over to you, but I think the first question I wanted to ask and just to establish is what is top talent? Because we hear this term and I think some employers or, or hiring managers aren't too sure what it, what it is. Thanks, Cindy. I think, um, I think before I start saying that I have 15 years of experience it makes me sound very old. I'm actually quite young. <laughs> I think being a, being a recruiter or being in the recruitment space, uh, where we are the link between the candidate and the employer positions us well to be able to empower both parties. And often, you know, being the middleman, you've got to navigate um, lots between both. So I think that um, has equipped us with the skills or the experience to identify what top, top talent is. And the starting point of understanding what top talent is, is important for us as business owners, recruiters, HR managers, because when you know what top talent is you know what to look for in candidates. So I think it starts with understanding the traditional but important qualities of top talent, which include your educational qualifications and experience. Now we do know that we're going through a, you know, a brain drain in our country at the moment. So there's definitely a list of scarce skills and qualifications that we have to make sure we know 
what they are and make sure that we understand that candidates with these skills and experience are considered top talent. Um, longevity, you know, there's, there's a question mark here for me with longevity um, on a CV because, or, or candidates that stay for long periods within their companies for two reasons. Number one, we're going to talk about, you know, this, this generation of work later on as we go along, but the current generation are not like us who stay in a job for five to 10 years. As soon as they feel unchallenged or they feel that the job doesn't meet the requirements, they're ready to move on. So I think sometimes we've got to understand that longevity is or, or a candidate that has moved every few years is not always a bad thing because that means they're hungry for uh, learning and development or improving or um, basically learning new skills. The other thing is, you know, I think we've got to change our perspective as recruiters or managers in the sense that if you see a candidate and you and you feel, you know what, they in the interview, they're not going to stay for a very long time. I think we need to start asking ourselves the question, if they do stay for a year or two, how much of value can they add to the organization? Because sometimes it's not about a candidate staying or it's not about an employee staying for 10 years. It's about what can they do in two years? You know, Cindy, you and I have experienced this where we've had people that have come in not for very long, um, but for one or two years, and they've made a massive impact on our organization. And we've grown tremendously because they, they like to do the jobs that possibly other people don't like to do, and it's improved our organization. So I think our mindsets do need to change. I think it's important to understand that top talent has achievements, which either are highlighted on their CV or discussed in an interview, which means they've got a proven track record of high performance and also great references. So not the reference from Uncle Bob. I think verifying the employer is very important because people can um, sometimes give you names of people that are not their actual employees or their colleagues or whatever the case may be. So great references are good because they will tell you things about the candidate that you cannot see on a CV or you they might not be able to articulate in an interview. Um, but I think the, the bottom line is that um, top talent are individuals that are passionate, productive, creative, um, potential leaders, and most importantly, they um, embrace or encourage teamwork. And you know, like Cindy, I think you you might want to speak a bit more on this, but when you inter when you hire a, a, a person who's top talent that positively influenced the culture of your company, it can be life-changing for an organization. But when you hire the wrong candidate that negatively influences your culture, there's a lot of damage control that we uh, as a management team would have to do. So I think for me, those are the those are the sort of top qualities or the qualities of top talent. Um, I'm, I hope this answers your question. Thanks, Rose. And I think for a lot of us on the call, you might be thinking, well, it could be related to your industry or to the vertical you're in. So as pro talent, um, one of our, our strong verticals is um, RT. And that is an area that, Everybody knows there's a massive shortage of skills. Uh, most IT people are quite mobile and can work remotely and, and are snatched up all over the place. So um, also we're seeing quite a lot of uh, skills shortages in the medical industry, um, in finance and technical and manufacturing as well. Pretty much, I think the top people in any category are, are um, you know, considered scarce skills as well. Um, you know, I read a statistic, another one I didn't make up. <laughs> the, um, it was a 2021 labor statistics report and it said the average annual turnover rate of companies is 57%. Um, that is horrific. It means that 57% of your staff leave in a year. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'd love to see in the chat if anyone has had any similar stats. If that is the case, then, um, you know, I think a lot of companies need to start not just looking at their hiring practices, but at their retention practices as well. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people say, okay, well, this is great. We, we're listening to this, but um, what do we do? How do we start, um, you know, making making it attractive, our company attractive to, to lure to, top talent to us? So one of the strategies that people are talking about is to create a talent pipeline. Now, for some of you, we might say, well, how do we do that? And I'm going to ask you, Rose, to just share some tips, like what can companies, and, and we know a lot of these companies that are on, on this call, a lot of them are friends of ours, clients of ours. What practical tips do you have for them to start creating a talent pipeline? So I think we all go through the same um, experiences where the person resigns 
they've given you the resignation letter and now you have to start the recruitment process and they've given you a month's notice. So that realistically means you've got a few weeks, you've got to advertise, interview, make the decision, all of that within a month. And then that person still possibly has a, a notice period, which means you might be two or three months sometimes without a key person in your organization. So I think um, the analogy that I would want to maybe um, t tell everybody right now is to not shop when you're hungry. So I think as organizations, especially those of us that are in uh, industries that require scarce skills, you've got to consistently be, um, you know, cr creating this talent pipeline where when candidates or when an employee leaves, you be you are able to fill the hole a little bit quicker because that obviously means that it's it's a smoother transition for the company and less time in lost in production or whatever the case may be. So I think having the mindset that you've constantly got to create this this pipe this talent pipeline is so important i mean we experience that cindy and i are always looking for good recruiters we always have opportunity eyes it can be anyone we experience anywhere and we're like this person would make a good recruiter and often we would interview even if we didn't have a position and when we do have a position we would remember that person which makes it a lot easier so i think it's important to understand you know where we are you know you mentioned Cindy the power relationship um, the changing power relationship between talent and the truth of the matter is candidates are now asking why should I join this company we as the recruiters have to sell our clients to top talent we've got to say listen the company offers this and have you had a look at them on social media um, this is the the EVP policy um, and, and you know this is what we've experienced with them from other candidates that we've placed within the company so I think it's so important to understand that in creating a talent pipeline You've got to you've got to know um, you've got to understand when you're dealing with top talent, you've got to make a good impression on them as well. So I think it starts firstly to put it into practical terms with assessing your current skills requirement in your company, making sure you know what are the key positions that you absolutely cannot do without. And constantly attracting talent in those positions, whether it's, um, you know, advertising, talent pool advertising, um, whether it's looking at your networks consistently and making sure that people know you're always looking for a specific skill. Um, and I think when you're creating your talent pipeline, make sure that there is a strong focus on employer branding. We'll speak about that a little bit later in the webinar, but that's a fundamental or key aspect when you're creating a talent pipeline because you can interview all the people you want. If they don't want to join your company, you're wasting your time. Um, I also think, Cindy, that we shouldn't underestimate the focus on training and development because it's actually cheaper to train and develop your people internally um, versus going and recruiting and starting from scratch and having to teach people the company policies, procedures, and train them into the position. Uh, we do something at ProTalent that works really well. We have an, a, a referral program, and I think a lot of companies do have that. But if you don't have that, I think it's important to look at implementing something like that where you actually reward your staff for referring people that they might not. Who better to know the organization and what the work entails rather than the staff that actually work there? So I think it's important to look at a referral program within your company. And these are practical, you know, practical things that you can do to create that talent pipeline. Um, and in saying that, you know, Cindy, I can talk about these types of topics the whole day. We, we really st stuck for time. But I think um, my advice would be to look at your recruitment process and make sure that it's not deterring top talent. Because often we have a candidate that is top talent that says, listen, I can't go for five interviews, three assessments and two other uh, processes, written processes or whatever before the client makes their decision. Because by the time you've done that, they've taken a job with another company. So I think it's important to, to make sure that your recruitment process is... Um, is not long, it's timeless and that you're giving feedback. And the last thing I want to say about this is make sure that you're empowering with management and supervisors to look out for talent and also to interview well. Often I find HR managers and HR professionals are good at interviewing, but when line management is sitting in the interview, they're grilling the candidate because they don't have the people skills to interview. So I think that's also important because that uh, contributes to the candidate experience, experience in the interview process. Thanks, Rose. Um, and yeah, and I think for me, um, one of the things I wanted to just mention was, you know, the, um, how do we attract top talent? Um, you know, Rose mentioned the talent pipeline, but I think there's been a, a seismic shift in the way companies need to position themselves. If we go back five or 10 years, um, in most companies, the customer is always the king. You know, we always heard that saying, customer is king. 
And often there was this perception gap between the customer is the most important person and then the staff are, be are beneath them. And I think that, tri the, the, you know, that triangle has actually turned upside down. So for a lot of yes. um, companies that are, are, are needing their, their staff are their biggest assets. Let's be honest. I know in my recruitment company, we've got desks and chairs and computers and printers and, and AI and software. But let me tell you, at five o'clock when they leave, all my assets have, got, have gone out of the business. I am very painfully aware of that. But mm -hmm. um, I think the thing is, you know, we talk about EVP, employer value propositions. It's 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 likened to a USP, a unique selling proposition. So, um, you know, we, we've always seen the uh, unique selling propositions in, in our marketing departments, in the way we brand our products and our company to our clients. But I think it's very, very important to have a very intentional strategy now to market yourself to the right talent, especially if you're, you're in, in the market for top talent, for people that are being um, targeted by your competitors or by other employers. So for me, it's, um, you know, a lot of companies are striving to be the best company to work for. Um, a lot of employee, employees and candidates are going to places like Glassdoor to check out company reviews. They are asking your staff, uh, you know, the world is so small now on social media. It's like, I've got a job opportunity at XYZ. What do you think? And people you people will tell you what they think. And and um, so I think that's really, really important to do that. Um, um, and also to ask yourself, what makes our company stand out? What is it about our business that a top person, be it IT, be it manufacturing, finance, anything, that they would want to leave a stable job to come here Be bearing in mind that top talent is not unemployed okay mm -hmm. they are all employed so they are they're going to have to make a decision to leave and right now because times are quite uncertain a lot of people are are thinking 10 times over before jumping from one opportunity to another they really want to make sure you know i don't want to be the last in the first art in an unstable company or an unstable industry um and then as rose had, had hinted to be PR minded in an interview. I think there are some clients who really want to be honest, but they take it to the next level. They give the gory details. They tell of the worst case scenarios. And, you know, I think we've got to be PR minded. You know, I love that saying. It's, it goes something like, you know, even if you decide you don't want to hire the person in the interview, I'm sure we've all had that. You walk into an interview and you know straight away this is the wrong person for whatever reason. You still conduct that interview in such a professional manner that that person would love to work for you, even though you don't want them to work for you. And remember, as much as we would we would do that in the marketing sense, we often haven't done that in a recruitment sense. Um, and I think it's very, very important to have a variety of ways to attract clients, uh, candidates, and to appeal to candidates. I know some companies are going to um, career shows. Um, you know, a lot of people um, uh, are networking, actively networking, uh, to find the right people. A lot of people are headhunting. Um, and as Rose said, always be hiring. I think that's so important. Um, and here's the thing, in your depart in your business, you probably each have one department or section where there's a, this constant churn. It could be your sales team, often it is. It could be your accounts department. But if that is the case, and you look back historically, like there's always three or four vacancies in that section a year, you need to always be hiring. Because imagine if you said, oh, gosh, we always need a salesperson. And if I said to you, listen, if I had a salesperson that I, uh, that, that I, you know, I knew was, was amazing, would you want to see them? Of course you, you do. So we have a lot of clients who also give us open specs. If you ever find, and they explain what they need, and then when we find those people, we send their CVs to them. That's another way as well. And your most uh, regular or, or common vacancies Put them on your websites as well and let people know. And like Rose said, incentivize your staff to um, to to refer their friends and family. And obviously, mm -hmm. a lot of companies do, don't uh, like taking on family, but I think sometimes we might have to review those policies as well. Um, I think that's really all I wanted to say on the EVP. But Rose, you know, one thing I've noticed is, like I've become old school now. I've been in business 30 years and I often look at people and I, I wonder, <laughs> you know, this new generation. Um, I have a lot of clients who often say to me, gosh, we don't want somebody in their 20s because they're too entitled. They too, we don't get them. They, 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 they spoiled, et cetera, et cetera. What, what do you think employee, employers on this call 
could learn or need to learn about the newest generation in the workplace because a lot of us might not be working with them right now, but maybe we need to dip into that uh, generation because that is the future of our, employ of our employees. Absolutely. So I think it starts with knowing who these generations are, Sandy. Currently in the workplace, we're working uh, amongst mostly millennials and Gen Z, and then you have the older generation, which is the Gen X. Um, so so the, the two generations that we all are trying to understand that have um, sort of left us sometimes wondering what happens are the millennials and the Gen Zs, which uh, I, in my opinion, they're quite different to the older generations. And one of the biggest problems we we experience with our clients, or even even in general, is is not understanding how what makes these these generations tick, or what fuels them, and and being able to manage them. I find often with my clients, they struggle to manage these two generations, the millennials and and Gen Z. And I think that it starts with an understanding of who they are and what what makes them or what um, sort of wakes them up every morning and makes them come to work? What what gives them the motivation that they need each day? So, you know, when, when talking about this, I must just tell you recently or maybe tell everybody that recently we've experienced a lot of declined offers with candidates. And this is made up of all different types of generations, but obviously predominantly we're dealing with millennials. And it's, it's a host of reasons, but we found that... Um, you know, companies are making counter offers or are get, uh, offering counter offers to candidates when they do, when they have found other jobs. And I think we need to think differently. I think that if we feel that a candidate or, or an employee rather is worth a lot more, we should be paying them what they worth, and we should be doing it at the end of the process when they've come to us and said, uh, "I found another job." And the reason is because as much as they will take the offer and stay, Cindy, you know this. Eighty percent of them are back. May, Possibly even 90% of them are back on the job market three months later and they're coming to us to say, listen, I shouldn't have taken the counter offer, still on the market, uh, I still want to see what's out there. So I think we, we we shouldn't be on the back foot as companies where we are making counter offers when people come to us to tell us what other companies are thinking they're worth. Whether they, and especially these generations, they'll take the a lot of them will just take the offer and move on because they now have been told what they worth. So I think we we need to be cognitive of um, paying people market related salaries or so paying our employees market related salaries. I also want to highlight as a recruiter. Um, or, or managing a recruitment team that we are finding one in three of our new starts are looking for other opportunities within six months of starting in the new company. That is a shocking stat. And often we find as recruiters, companies get it right through the recruitment process, but it falls down as soon as we as the person starts. As soon as induction, orientation, um, sort of handling a new person, that process starts companies fall down in that regard. And we've done so many talks on onboarding and induction simply because, you know, um, all of this work has gone into recruiting, but the candidate or the, the employee is not ready to leave because they haven't had a good experience in the induction process. So so just just a just a side note on that, something that we need to consider. But basically we've we we we're now experiencing three generations in the workplace. You know, our grandparents worked to put food on the table. Our parents worked for security and stability. Millennials and Gen Zs are not working for that. They are um, in more comfortable positions, a lot of them. And, and why shouldn't they be? Because the previous generations worked hard so that the current generations can have a better quality of life. So I think we also need to understand, like, why are we blaming them for being lazy or entitled when a lot of us are actually parents of this, these generations and allowing this type of um, this perspective? So I think we need to understand that they live in a totally different world and they navigate through a totally different lifestyle than we did. So the first most important thing is when you have these generations working in your company, understanding their characteristics and knowing how to manage their best. Remember that social media is part of their lives. Everybody knows everything about everybody. It's different to the, the older times where, you know, there was not much information. Now everything's available on social media. Um, you know, just an interesting thought, Cindy, that, you know, when you look at a person on social media and they look good and they've got lots of likes on LinkedIn and Facebook, we're learning about influencers now. It's something new to Cindy and I. But then they come across as they have the best job. 
They're earning the most amount of money. They have the most flexible hours and they have the best boss. So I think that image now is, is has become so important to these generations that it's a lot of what they focus on. And they're very vocal about what is not working well in their lives. So, you know, the, the, the upside to these generations, especially millennials, we'll start talking about them, is that they're the most adaptive and creative generations. They value meaningful motivation. So, um, you often, and I manage quite a few of them in the office, you often have got to give them a pat on the back, tell them they're doing a good job, give them uh, feedback. They thrive on that type of thing. It's different to the older generation that will get on with the job and, you know, intrinsically are motivated. This generation needs constant feedback and motivation. They are very, um, very good at technology. Um, they can fix any problem that you can't fix. So I think we need to hone in on that. They place importance um and tasks rather than time. They have a passion for learning and developing. They, um, they're free thinkers, they're creative, and they value teamwork and social interactions in the workplace. Um, you know, like I, with some of the with some of the millennials in the office, when they start telling a story, I'll be like, is this going to be a one minute story? Because they love to talk about something that's happened, express what has happened. They just, they love that interaction. Whereas you'll find all the people would just want to get on with their work or the older generations are the one and just get on with the work and they're rolling their eyes trying to listen to this long story. So I think trying to understand that they are expressive is important. Gen Z, they expect to work with modern technology. If you're not giving them a laptop that's up to date, they're going to constantly pester you for that. Um, they, they prefer in-person in interactions. So they like to have one-on-ones with uh, management. They, they have a entrepreneurial mindset. Um, they're not so tall... They're not so tolerant of authoritative environments. So you have to find a way to get everything out of them that you need without being bossy about it or without saying you have to do this. So I think that's something we need to learn. They don't respond well to authority because they're free thinkers and they want to find other ways of doing things and they often want to be rebellious just from a learning perspective. Um, they embrace change. They value flex flexibility. And one of the key things about the, the current generation, you know, that we were Gen Z, the, the youngest of the lot, is that they are very competitive. So understanding their uh, characteristics will allow us or help us to, to manage them better. I hope that answers the question, Sandy. Thanks, Rose. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. I also read somewhere that the, the newest generation in the workplace are more interested in the promises of today and the experience today than the big um, promises of the future. So, you know, um, a lot of the times people have these buy-in agreements or these like a lock-in agreements, like a five-year plan. If you stay with us, you can get shares in five years or 10 years. That doesn't seem to be that exciting. And also, I think what I'm noticing as well with the, the massive cost of living increase, a lot of people would rather not have retirement funding, but have more funding to live now. So I think, the, which, is a, which is quite a frightening thought for people like us who who make the decisions on pay and benefits. So I definitely think for companies on this call, review your, your salaries, review your benefits. Are they in line? Uh, as you say, you almost want to avoid the recruitment by retaining the people you've got. And we see it so often where employers will, will, will go through loads and loads of interviews and then say, oh, actually, Johnny in dispatch, we're going to promote him. <laughs> and poor Johnny is really an afterthought. So um, that's not very motivating for people who've been there who probably can do the job. So I think those are important things as well. And then what a funny insight. Isn't it funny? Many of us are parents to young people in their teens or 20s, and we spoil our own kids, yet we don't want to hire other people's spoiled ch children. Isn't that funny? <laughs> um, and it reminds me of the um, the five Fs that people want, fame. So that well, the first F is for fame. You know, a lot of people love recognition. They love a, a workplace where they 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 believe that what they do matters and is recognized. And remember, this generation they had graduations when they they left preschool. They got they got participation awards. They did. So they're used to that. They're used to being told how amazing they are. And sometimes we forget that um, you know that that uh, we we think well like why should it stop now? <laughs> um, and then the the second F is freedom. Uh, you know, a lot of people want, and it's not about being away from the office. That's more like freedom is in autonomy to do what they want when they want and not be micromanaged. I think that's a big thing. So, you know, if you are sitting there in an environment where you feel everyone's leaving all the time and you're the manager, it probably is you. <laughs> you know, they say people don't leave a company, they leave a manager. 
And and I think one thing we've had to learn through the, the last five years of massive change is we have to change our management styles. And, and you know, a lot of people, I've, I've, I've coached a lot of managers who've had to change in the way they lead their people. I've had to change as well. And the one thing we cannot afford to say is that's just the way I am because it's no longer working. Unless you've got very compliant people or you rule by fear, uh, you're not really going to win if you, if you are too much of an autocratic manager. The next F is finance. Obviously, people want to be paid appropriately. And, um, you know, when somebody looks at a job description, the first thing they look at is actually the money, but then they look at the job description. So it's not only about the money, but I think it's about being paid well enough for the job. And hopefully all the other conditions are favorable. The 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 other F is fun. You know, um, like, do, do you have a positive workplace? And I think that comes to culture as well, which Rose, I think I'd like you to chat about just now. And then the other one is the flexibility um, that a lot of people are asking for now. And we've seen this big backlash, you know, over COVID, everybody was sent home and um, big co companies were, were, were saying to staff, it's okay, do, do whatever you want, work where you want. Um, and then we saw Elon Musk uh, send out a, a memo. Uh, he, is, he loves to be unpopular, I think. But he said, you know, if you're going to continue working from home, um, you know, if you don't come to the office, you can continue to bluff you working elsewhere. <laughs> and um, a lot of companies are now wanting people back in the office. But I think it's about understanding, can they do the job from home? And is it something that that we can allow some flexibility with? And with the rising cost of uh, petrol as well, it might be something to consider even a day a week or something like that could be, could be um, a wonderful thing. Also, if you think about it, during COVID, people had their first taste of freedom for many years. I know a lot of people who'd never, ever been spent time with their children. And now, if you think about it, you might have a, a working mom in your company, and she says, it's my daughter's or my son's um, award ceremony. Um, you know, I think it's quite quite imperative now for companies to say, okay, please go to that. You know, even if they have to make up the time otherwise. But, but I think for, for the things that matter, let people have some flexibility. Not to question why are you going to the doctor or why are you going to the dentist, but I think allowing that flexibility, I think that's so, so important. Um, Rose, uh, retaining people once you've hired them, is there anything else you want to share on that? Um, you know, I think, Cindy, that boils down to culture, like we said. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's so important to have the, the right company culture and you can attract top talent and they can take up the opportunity based on what you've promised them in the interview um, and they can also make promises to you to come in and do magnificent things within the company. But if they come there and your culture is not a fit for them, they're going to run. So I think we have to be, um, we have to, we have to navigate change and we have to be, um, we have to pilot the change, if I can say, because I think if we don't start thinking about changing the culture within our organizations, if it's not a good culture, then we're never going to retain top talent and we're never going to take our organizations to the next level. So I think, you know, things that you've already mentioned, like micromanaging people, um, having rigid working hours. I think, you know, if you think about the current economic conditions that we've got to work and live in with the traffic and the petrol costs and the construction on the roads and, and the list goes on, I think being a little bit uh, or being rigid with working hours and conditions, uh, you're not going to keep top talent if you're going to be that way. Um, I think recognizing people, you know, sometimes it's not also always about money. It's about making sure that your people that go the extra mile know that you appreciate the efforts. It, sometimes it's a simple email that you'll send um, or it's a simple message just or a note on the table just to say thanks for your for your hard work or thanks for sorting something out for me. That will make your employees and top talent want to want to go the extra mile for you. I think we also need to look at, you know, and this is something that we also pride ourselves in, in, in that looking at your facilities, your equipment, laptops, that sort of thing, make sure that, you know, people have the facilities and the equipment that they need to work at the optimal levels. It's the worst thing. And as recruiters, we have zero patience. We have a reputation for not having patience. But if your laptop is slow or it's giving you a problem, you literally throw your toys out the cart because you've got so many deadlines, you've got so many things to do in a day. The last thing you need is your equipment slowing you down. And most importantly, you know, Cindy, I feel as leaders, we don't always have time to think about this, but we have to have 
um, we have to make time to train and to develop our staff. We have to make sure that they are, they know that we are invested in their development. We have to create variety in their jobs because a lot of jobs are monotonous in many ways. So we we've, we've got to step out of the box and think: How can I make the role interesting? How can I develop this person? Is it a course? Is it a talk that they need to attend? Is it something that I can do to enrich them? Um, you know, this is so important for us to think about because. I often find as a, as a leader, it's it's sometimes a difficult place to be in because you've got to be firm when you need to be and your staff need to be able to handle that. And you've also got to be, um, you know, uh, somebody that listens and encourages and motivates your staff. So it's a balance between both. And I think if you don't get the motivation and the encouragement and the investing in your staff right, where they feel like you're actually there for them to win, when you're trying to be hard and you're trying to say, listen, this is non-negotiable. I need this to be done. When can I have this? Can I have this by close of business? Or you also trying to reprimand them for something that they've actually done. You're not going to get their buy-in. They're going to end up leaving or they're going to end up resenting you or they're going to end up just being rebellious because they don't believe that you have their best interests at heart. So I think, yes, we can attract top talent, but retaining them definitely has to do with our company culture, which is something that we have to work on if we are in leadership positions in a company. That makes sense, Rose. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I read a statistic uh, that said that 31% of workers leave a job within the first six months. 31, that's like a third of people that are hired. But out of Absolutely. that third, out of that third, 68% of them leave within the first three months. And I think that definitely comes to onboarding. And, you know, uh, just a few points that I think people might bear in mind. You know, when somebody comes in, you know, I think you've got to make their first week absolutely delightful. Um, you've got to have the contracts ready. It's unbelievable how many candidates will phone us or, we, or we'll phone them in their first week. How are you? And, and you can hear they're, they're not that excited. Um, they've basically been told, follow John. <laughs> and John is not wanting them to follow him. You know, and um, or there's no specific plan. There's no welcome. These are all sm small, tiny little things. But have the contracts ready. Have an induction plan. Get your staff involved. Um, get everyone to have tea with them on their first day, have, give them a little gift. You know, it, I think that these are small things. A lot of our employees are doing them and it just creates such a beautiful tone. Get people to sit, give them a buddy, give them a mentor. Um, but it seems like a lot of us, uh, it's it's never a convenient time to recruit, is it? I mean, we always, it's, it's always at the worst time. That person's left, we're under pressure. But um, I think to show people that you care, show them you care by, by actually caring. Um, so I think that onboarding process is important. Um, but also just going back to the hiring of people, I think just a couple of tips. I, I would encourage employers to create a, a consistent interview process and, you know, um, decide what questions you're going to ask. Um, get your line management trained. I think we're preaching to the choir here. Most of you on the call are probably owners, managers, HR, um, and, and recruitment managers who understand that. But, you know, we often have candidates saying, gosh, you won't believe what they ask me. And don't ask the weird stuff. Like if you were an animal, what would you be? Why? Why do you ask that? <laughs> um, don't ask questions that show discrimination. Uh, for instance, we'll have clients saying, oh, gosh, no, we can't take on that lady. She's about to have another baby. And we go, what makes you think that? No, I can just tell. Or stupid, stupid things like that. You wouldn't say that, but other people do. And 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 remember, just to understand our own biases. Everybody has biases. You know, so you might find that you're attracted or you, uh, certain uh, people appeal more to you, maybe people that went to the school you went to or live in your area or have some area of commonality. And sometimes we've got to put our biases aside and say, is this the best person for the job? It's not about likability. I'm not dating them. I'm not going to be their best friend. They actually, are they suited to the job? Um, and then also to understand some people, we, sometimes we've got champagne taste and beer money. And uh, we would love that top level person, but the, this, the salary offer doesn't actually meet that. So, you know, we've got to look at what's what's relative in the marketplace as well. And and also understanding the questions we don't ask, you know. So, for instance, um, you know, not asking questions about, uh, you know, you would ask the same questions of a man and a woman. You wouldn't ask questions about somebody's political beliefs or sexual orientation or anything like that. Um, but sometimes you find that clients do ask these terribly awkward questions and that's not great. And on another note, I think another area that you touched on, Rose, is diversity. But the big issue with diversity is you have to add and inclusion. 
Because a lot of clients are saying, we want somebody of color in this role, but the person of color arrives and they are not welcome. They are not included and there's, they leave and they don't leave because they're incompetent. They leave because they were never made to fit in. And I used to have a view of culture as the way we do things around here. And I've changed my view of that because if it's the way we do things around here, what if somebody comes in and has a new way or a better way? So for me, culture is now, uh, I've seen it as something quite porous. A new person can add their flavor to the culture and they're welcome. And I think that's a question maybe we can ask ourselves. In our company, mm -hmm. are we stuck with the culture from 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Are we welcoming to new people? And do people feel safe to speak up and say, I've got an idea? I think that's important. Um, and also creating an environment where there's mentorship, where there's a path of growth. I think a lot of people are looking for growth um, opportunities. And um, I think that's really, really an important thing. Um, so Rose, any, any other questions, um, and any, any, any other comments on like, you know, we all want to be an employer of choice. Obviously that would be ideal if possible. Um, any, any ideas on how we can get there? So, you know, I, I like to speak from experience and because I think it's the best teacher and, you know, as a recruitment agency, you would know this recruitment agencies don't have the best reputation in, in industry. And I've also worked for previous recruitment agencies, so I can identify with this. But what I think we've done in a tough industry is we've created a culture that we can be quite proud of. So I think that becoming an employer of choice, sometimes we feel we're limited by the industry industry that we're in. We're actually not. We actually create the culture in the companies that we work in. So I think um, you know, we've created a, a, a culture that, are, that encourages longevity because we don't have a high staff turnover. Our staff are happy to come to work. Or, or they make us feel like they're happy to come to work. Um, we give them opportunities to grow. Our recruiters are not just recruiters. They they speak on recruitment-related topics. They attend uh, different uh, events. They, uh, they Some of them study. They train in different areas. There's lots of variety in the work, which we work very hard to create so that there's the right culture in our company. So I think, I think you know, for me, uh, if you were to ask me about being an employee of choice, it very much starts with the recruitment process. And, you know, like just recently, just the other day, and you think it doesn't happen in this day and age, but just the other day I had uh, candidates going to a client for, for interviews. This is a corporate client with a great reputation in industry, national, international company, all of that benefits everything. But I must tell you that most of the candidates came back and said they had a bad interview experience simply because the interviewer who is on the management team just was very unwelcoming, unfriendly, sort of made, grilled them, asked them difficult questions uh, and made them feel, every one of them felt like they weren't right for the position, even though they were selected for the interviews based on the fact that they had relevant experience. So we need to ask ourselves, you know, what type of experience are the candidates that are coming into our doors having with our company? Create the right experience for candidates, whether you're going to, like Cindy said, whether you're going to hire them or not. They need to be excited about the opportunity. They need, they need to leave your organization and say, oh my gosh, when can I start? I really want this job, whether they get it or not. And I think, you know, what I've learned within the years of interviewing or the years of interviews that I've done is you've got to be real in an interview. You know, like it's not, it's the, 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 obviously the, the power has now changed. But besides that, nobody wants to work with somebody that comes across as perfect, uptight, too smart, a know-it-all. Like people want to identify with people. So let's be those people that are real in, in the interview process. So perhaps share your journey, like where you've come from. You started off as, as the receptionist and now you've become the HR manager as an example. Um, I think it's also important, Cindy, you touched on this, but to ask value-based questions, not only related to the job, but to learn more about the person. We've realized as recruiters now, besides our job be being investigators, but we've also learned that we've got to get to know the person because it's very much about how the person is going to fit in with our client. We we, we like to believe we have a good understanding of who our clients are. Um, and, and so getting to know the person will will make will straight away tell you whether the, it is the right person to send through to a client. So they could tick the boxes from an experience point, but from a culture point, they might not because of their personalities. 
Um, you know, another thing that I want to mention is like I do a lot of technical recruitment where I'm sending um, artisans and technicians and murrays and engineering uh, managers for interviews. And these people are operational and then they get put into a panel interview, which can be so daunting. They, they come out of that and they feel like, oh, my gosh, I've never experienced something so daunting in my entire life. So I think as HR professionals, business managers, um, or, or business owners, rather, we need to understand that panel interviews can be quite daunting. So if you have to do a panel interview, which I think is a good idea, um, it's best to put the candidate at ease right from the beginning, just so they don't feel uh, this anxiety. And remember, when if a candidate is anxious in an interview, you're not getting anything out of them. You're not getting them to express the real person or the real people that they are to you because they're just too nervous to do that. Um, I think it's important for us to describe what the successful role looks like. Like, what are we looking for in a person? And remember that you are presenting to them as much as they are presenting to you. Um, if we understand that it makes every person, every candidate that's ever interviewed by our, our companies uh, feel like, you know, they want to refer other people. You know, if I look at my own experience as a candidate many times, I went for an interview with a very prestigious company. I walked in the doors and I was like, oh my gosh, blown away. I was blown away before I could even get to reception. And I thought to myself, gosh, Rose, did you actually get an interview with this company? But I must tell you, when I went through the interview process with the, with the panel of, of managers that were interviewing me, I was totally unimpressed to the point where I declined the position because I felt like, there's no way I'm going to sit in an organization with a culture like this and be happy. And I think a lot of people need to be happy at work because they're spending a lot of time at work. So I think the way we conduct ourselves in interviews, that's the starting point for me, Cindy, because I am a recruiter or we are in recruitment and we specialize in recruitment is get it right from the beginning. Um, you know, there's a few more, there's a few more thoughts that I just quickly want to share on this is that we need to be aware that everything's on social media. So do we have, uh, as an employer, have a social media presence. If you want to be, be an employer of choice, you've got to invest in this. If you're not good at doing it, you've got to get somebody that, that does it for you. Um, Cindy mentioned Glassdoor, LinkedIn, Facebook, all provides insight and information to companies. Um, it's important to, to build your brand externally, but also internally as well. Remember, candidates are spoiled for choice. Often top talent, often, now way too often they are interviewing with three or four companies at the same time. Do not ever believe that a, comp a person is standing in front of you and they're going to wait five weeks for you to offer them this job. They are often, I can't tell you in the last six months how many times I went back to a candidate with an offer and they're like, actually, sorry, I've taken an offer with another company. I didn't know that this one was going to come through, but it's been now six weeks, so I have taken another job. So I think it's important for us to understand that building our brands is important internally and externally. Um, and recruitment is one of the ways in which we are brand building. Um, I think also, Cindy, you know, you mentioned where we're coming from in terms of COVID and things. We've got to also make candidates realize that or, or, or um, we've got to tell them that we are stable because a lot of candidates come back or convince them rather. A lot of candidates come back and they're like, I, I, I don't mind the job. I, I can do the job, but I'm just worried about the stability of the company. So if there is a question around that, maybe because of the industry that you're in, uh, maybe because of the position, reassure candidates in an interview that you are a stable organization. Nobody's going to want to leave their jobs to join another company and be retrenched afterwards. And remember, a lot of people have gone through this in the last year because of COVID. So I think be cognitive of that in the interview. The last thing I want to say about this in the employer branding and being an employer of choice is the most important question, which is, what is your staff saying about you? Our staff are our biggest amb ambassadors. Um, you know, if you look, if you if you do the research, you'll find that candidates trust companies, employees three times more than they will trust a company to produce, to provide credible information on what it's like to work there. They will go to the people in your organization. I, I tell the story sometimes in that I sent a candidate for an interview and they were sitting at reception and somebody walked past and said, don't take the job. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's a funny story and you wouldn't expect that, but it, it did happen. It's, it's not made up. It's, it's the truth. It, it actually happened. And it's so sad because, you know, like if your staff feel like that, even if they're not telling the person in the interview, when the person starts from day one, you're going to have um, a Susan that's going to be telling them how, 
dreadfully just to work in this organization and who to look out for and who's the problematic people. So I think it's so important for our, our employees to be happy. And yes, you can't please everyone, but at least create a culture where our employees are happy to uh, recommend people and, and give them a good experience even when they join the company. Thanks, Rose. I think that's really, really important. I love that saying. It says, um, you know, culture is how your employees feel on Sunday night about coming to work on Monday. <laughs> and I often interview people who say, I get that sick feeling in my stomach at the thought of coming to work on Monday. We don't want to create that in our businesses. And I think uh, just to reiterate, I think one of the biggest challenges we have as recruiters is candidates drop off from wanting to, to be employed because the client has taken over two weeks to give us any feedback. And I know what happens, it's it's a busy time, it's a long process, but I think even if it's a case of you in the running, um, you know, bear with us, we've got another week. Um, so I think they say feedback is the breakfast of champions. And I, I think giving feedback to candidates is so important. We've got literally six or seven minutes. If anybody has a question and you want to put it in the chat or you want to put up your hand or, or unmute yourself, you are so welcome. But I think we've pretty much come to the end of what we wanted to share with you. But if there are any questions, we are so happy to, to do that. While we're waiting for that, can we maybe do a lucky draws, Rose? Yes, we can. Okay. So we've created a list from everyone that's registered for the webinar. And we've got four books to give away. Cindy, you want to maybe just show everybody? So it's, it's yeah, it's two of the unstoppable books and two of the how does she do it? It's it's both us and these best-selling books. So what I've done is we've got a randomizer and I've just, I'm just going to choose the, um, the numbers and then I'll tell you the names of the people that have won the books and uh, we will make arrangements to career it to you. Okay. So if you just give me a minute. Okay. The first person is number four, which is Nobushle Matobela. Are you, are you here? Can you unmute? Just checking if you're here. If you're not, then I'll move on. Okay, we'll move on. The next person is number 32, which is Tusi Pata. Can we get a wave? Okay, I'm moving on. Um, then we have Nomtan Das, though. Mm. Ngomezulu. She is on the course. Hi. Yes, I'm here. Okay. So you're the first recipient of, of one of Cindy's books, and we will make arrangements to clear the book to you. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. The next person is Chris Ann Govinda. Are you here? Not here. Okay. Um, I've got Michelle van der Vault. Michelle. Okay, I'm not getting anything from her. Then I've got Mushle. I'm not sure how to pronounce your Chetire. surname. Chetire. She's on the call. Chetire. Yeah. Is she on the call? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, great. Okay. Um back. Stephanie Munsami. Stephanie's on the call. I didn't see her. Um, and Chrisanne is here as well. Oh, Chrisanne is here. Okay, Chrisanne, we've got you. You would be one of the recipients of the book. Thank Hi. you, thank you, thank you, guys. My mic is giving me issues. Yeah, I don't know. You're I just hold the guy. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't Stephanie, see Stephanie. Are you still oh, on the call? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Stephanie, no, you're the no, fourth no, recipient. No, I'm just doing it Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Stephanie, yeah. we'll get a book to you, yeah, Stephanie. Stephanie. We'll get a book through to you. Those are our four winners for the lucky draw prizes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rose. Um, and I see there was a question here about um, what about hiring people with disabilities and um, maybe people with ADHD? Um, I think there's a massive trend at the moment to um, you know, when you talk about diversity and inclusion, um, we we talk about neurodiverse individuals, people with, um, you know, maybe certain behavioral or emotional or or psychological conditions that normally, you know, in the past people might have gone, oh, that that's that's somebody we wouldn't want to employ, but we're definitely seeing um, 
especially among, amongst bigger corporates, uh, a tendency towards acceptance and to even celebration of the fact that people are are, are different and and welcoming them.